Yes. Yes, thank you. About war and education in all its complex syntax, uh, and uh, I'm going to join them uh, using different prepositions. And uh, uh, my talk about is about the context of Russian-Ukrainian war and uh, education, and about war against education, education for war, education against war, and war for education. Uh, when uh, the Russians started war against Ukraine, I was in Poland as a visiting professor, but uh, I did not consider staying there in safety. I decided to immediately return to my country because uh, there were my family and people who really needed me and I knew it. I felt that there were a lot of essential things to do and uh, actually that's why I returned and one of them was telling the truth to as many people as possible that is why I am here with you today thank you for joining and listening to me I beg your pardon if, if sometimes I am too honest too open or too emotional I cannot count the number of times I had to suspend my preparation for this talk because of bomb alarms, you know, and then you're very alert and very emotional, in fact. Every time I prepare to speak somewhere, I realize that the situation in Ukraine has, in Ukraine has changed since my last presentation, even if, if, if it was the day before. Since the beginning of Russian-Ukrainian war, the time has squeezed and every day we live through equals a year. And every moment we wake up, we celebrate like a new year. Every day we become a year older, a year wiser and uh, more resilient. We learn how to overcome losses and how to analyze, uh, learn, hope and surely remember. And surely we realize that this war did not start on the 24th of February, 2022. Actually, it has lasted for generations since Moscow emerged and started its rapacious existence aiming at capturing territories, killing and deporting people and appropriating other cultures. Here are some examples of usual rhetoric and historically proven practices. Uh, for example, Putin claims that Ukraine did not exist as a separate state and had never been a nation. But Kyiv is nearly twice as old as Moscow and uh, there are numerous proofs of Ukrainian uh, legacy dating many centuries back. Uh, Putin claims uh, that Russia won the victory in the Second World War and paid the tribute of more than 24 million people killed in action, and not only in action. In fact, Russia did not lose 24 million people. It was the USSR, which consisted at that time of 15 republics, including Russia and Ukraine. By different evidence, around eight 10 million people out of this number were Ukrainians, uh, which is 40 or 44 percent of the USSR total losses. If you have a look at the map, you will see that 100 territory uh, percent of the territory of Ukraine was occupied, and it was the main battlefield during World War II, and 100 of its population suffered from the war. On the contrary, only a tiny part, several percent of the Russian territory suffered from the war. And the map shows it. And now Russia is exploiting the German collective guilt complex. Peskov, Russian presidential spokesman, claims that uh, this is a quotation. Russia, throughout all its history, has never attacked anyone. However, since the breakout of the totalitarian USSR, there has hardly been a two-year period when Russia was not at war. These are just some of the examples that the same words can, be, can bear a different meaning for the parties which exist in the opposite worlds. One world wants to leave, and the other one wants to kill it. One world wants to live in peace and the other one 
wants to live in war. One world wants our planet to have the future and the other one wants to destroy it. One world wants to move to the future and the other one wants to move to the past. Uh, to make Ukrainians better understood, I would like to involve you in complex syntax rules of using different prepositions that can dramatically change the meaning of the statement. These rules are far from being purely linguistic. They add coher coherence to social processes and the current situation. The words war and education are abstract notions. Still, if connected by different prepositions, they acquire real meaning and require action to save humanity and make it indissoluble and make an indissoluble bridge between the past and the future. I will look at different prepositions that might, might connect these words and reinforce the, fra the phrase with examples from Ukrainian higher education during the current Russia-Ukrainian war. I will also share some stories of the Ukrainian Educational Research Association members that I am representing today. The war has become a powerful reminder that we should value every day, every person close to us, and it is so painful to read on different university, Ukrainian universities' websites and Facebook pages that they are mourning their best sons, either academics, students, or alumni. All that remains, all that remains to us is a memory of highly intellectual and faithful Ukrainians who could give birth to the nation's new generation that is now desperately struggling for existence. For the existence of Ukraine, Europe, and even the humanity. Russians are now trying to root out everything that is Ukrainian. Books, museums, churches, schools, universities, and even children. And this is the war of against education part. You must be perfectly aware that education is one of the most potent tools for maintaining the nation's spirit so Russians are now trying to physically destroy it by bombs and missile strikes. There is a special uh, site created by the Ministry of Education and Science that provides information about the destroyed educational establishments like kindergartens, schools, uh, vocational schools and universities in numbers and in pictures. As by May the 16th, 1,000 uh, 1, 748 educational establishments suffered from bombardments. 144 were completely destroyed. Some of them were destroyed with people, like the school in Bivakor, Kalugansk region, where on the 8th of May, practically all the village inhabitants were hiding. They were hiding and were buried there as the bomb from the aircraft was purposefully sent onto the school. In the same way as the bomb was dropped on the Mariupol theater, in spite of the fact that the word children written before this building was clearly seen from the plane. Again, I guess that it was the reason why the explosion's epicenter was exactly there. This was another step to the extinction of new generations of Ukrainian. War against education is led in the occupied cities and villages with kidnapping school principals and teachers who do not want to open schools in occupation. You may ask, why don't they want to open schools? This is their job. Because if the children are at school, Russians can use them as a human shield manipulate their parents or kidnap the children and deport them to Russia. Universities in occupation also face the uneasy choice to surrender and become an outpost of betrayal and love, lie, or to move to other regions of Ukraine and start from scratch as displaced one do. However, even if they lose all the buildings and infrastructure, they preserve their good name, faithful students in academics. Actually, this is what real education is about. 
On the 5th of May, our association, together with the Drogobich University, organized a round table where its members from Ukrainian universities on the territories temporarily occupied by Russians told their personal war stories and the stories of their universities in Mariupol, Melitopol, and Kherson. Olga Goncharova from Melitopol and Elena Fedorova from Kherson told us how they organized underground opposition to help their universities break collaborators' plans to make them pillars of the aggressive regime in their regions. As a result, they became displaced, as well as Mariupol State Universities, the buildings of which were completely destroyed, and many academics and students killed or died under bombs and missiles. However, the survivors are now working on the university revival and dreaming about its development in a new place, which is Kyiv. At the same time, they are desperate about the part of the university population who are still in Mariupol and are kept there as in concentration camp. As Vladislav Kudlaikul managed to escape from Mariupol told us, the Russians took away their passports and make them, made them work hard to get some food. And the work they were supposed to do was connected with taking away dead bodies and clearing the streets from remnants and rubbish as the occupants were preparing for the war parade in Block Mariupol. Blocked but not occupied, as the Azov regiment was defending the island of freedom inside the destroyed city that used to be one of the fastest developing cities in Ukraine. War against education damages school and university buildings, books, museums, memorial and concert halls. Russians may do their cruel and dirty job by killing school and university students and teachers. However, it will not be able to wipe out the culture of the nation with roots as long as its, educa as long as its education teaches their citizens to think critically inspires them to dream and shows them how to love freedom and to be free, free from fear, from pressure and from propaganda. Education and propaganda are like water and oil that will never mix. They should never mix. If they mix, it is ultimately a different story. It is the story of education for war where the role of education is imposing propaganda targeted at inhuman actions. Here I will show examples demonstrating that schools and universities can play an infamous role if they are led by a distorted purpose that has nothing to do with development, critical thinking, academic integrity and independence. The first example is the history subject taught at Russian schools and universities. It is falsely imposing on Russian young generation a distorted colonial vision of Ukraine. The picture that emerges is that of a country that has never existed and will never exist. The country that has never had its language, education and culture. Russians do not even use Ukraine as the country's name, preferring to call it Malo Russia, that is small Russia. The history books are marked by manipulation facts, their omission and distortion of events. Ukraine is presented as a country of racism, xenophobia, religious intolerance, extremism, neo-Nazi sentiment, banditry and physical violence. This was a quote from White Paper on Human Rights Violations and Principle of the Rule of Law in Ukraine, which appeared in 2014. We are not fascists or Nazis, as Russia presents us. So don't be deceived by Russian public narratives about the non-existent threats that they say they feel from us. Russian's real main narrative is their deeply rooted refusal to recognize Ukrainian Ukraine's right to exist. That simple and that clear. You can see it in their media, private conversations, official statements and infamous Putin's articles published last year. The very fact of our claim to have the right to exist is offensive for Russians. So offensive that they are ready and willing to destroy us. 
And in fact, it is not about threat from Ukraine or about threat from NATO as Russians present it. It is about deeply rooted terrorism, gangsterism and looting on their part and hatred for everything that is Ukrainian. People who are being killed, books that are being burned, history that has been distorted and pieces of art that are being stolen, the freedom that has been encroached on. Just fancy, they are burning Ukrainian books. They have the list of authors and books and even school history textbooks to burn. Russians have been preparing for war for a very long time. They are planning to open schools, make teachers follow the imposed curriculum. They attempt uh, to, as they call it, save people from such cities and deport them to depressive regions like Russian Sakhalin and instead to populate Ukrainian lands with people who do not want to know the taste of freedom. This kind of hatred demonstrated by Russians does not come overnight. It may come gradually through education, through media, through fear and silent acceptance. It is not about Putin exclusively. It is about millions of Russians supporting him. It is about teachers who justify the aggression and deliver lessons of patriotism to Russian children. It is about university rectors supporting the inhuman slaughter for no reason. It is about those who do not support, but keep silent. On the contrary, education against war, or to be more positive, education for peace, is driven by the need to promote the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that help people live in peace. Here I can point at it as the principal purpose of primary, secondary and higher education, which has not been paid proper attention to. It has been overlooked as if a priori the good had had sufficient strength to fight down the evil. Yes, it is true. The good has strength. However, the strength appeared without the decisive influence of international organizations created and extensively funded to maintain the peace of the planet. When the war started, where was the United Nations? UNESCO, Red Cross, European Union, NATO, others, the bureaucratic machines were too slow and inflexible and the time was squeezed, fast and violent. Where were intellectuals, Russian, European intellectuals? They were either silent or calling for peaceful dialogue under a barrage of missiles. The strength came from the momentum of a flurry of the Ukrainian army and debunking the Western intelligence forecast that the country would be occupied for two, three days. This and the leadership of Ukrainian common people who mobilized in no time and worked miracles of networking and creating conditions for resistance. Zelensky's from position and courageous speeches to the world population also contributed to the change of rhetoric from we are deeply concerned through we stand with Ukraine to support will continue until Ukraine's victory. Ukraine's victory will come, however, with great sacrifice, with thousands of soldiers and peaceful citizens killed by Russians, millions of Ukrainians who fled abroad or were displaced in Ukraine, with ruined kindergartens, schools, universities, theaters, museums, houses and infrastructure. All this could have been avoided if education had done its most important job based on history lessons. Education for peace is something that we, alas, have overlooked and neglected. And the war we are suffering from is not just Russia's war against Ukraine. It is the war for honesty, straightforwardness, for democracy and for peaceful world order. And when do we have to start educating children for peace, you may ask? At school? At university? 
there is a continual uh, negotiation of mutual understanding, demanding that we listen to and learn from each other in order to be able to communicate across cultural and spatial boundaries. I will tell you my personal story that helped me answer the question, when? When do we have to stop? Children can easily do it using their Esperanto baby language. When my daughter was an Erasmus Mundus PhD student in Poland, she surely took her family with her, and I came to babysit when my grandson was two years old. You know that academic teachers are not bad at babysitting, but not for a long time. So that week, uh, we had an absolutely brilliant experience of multicultural communication at the playground near the residence hall for international students and their children. My grandson played with a boy, or they both played with a fire engine and talked all the time. The boy's grandma came up to me and said how happy she was that at last there was something who understood her grandson. The matter was that he lived in France and not surprisingly he spoke French and his Polish speaking grandma didn't understand him, but my Ukrainian speaking grandson perfectly understood him and they had fluent communication. And later he improved his skills with children from Macedonia, Georgia, Italy, Armenia and other countries. Children are born to live in peace. Children are born to understand each other. Children should not be born, born in bomb-proof shelters, which frequently happens in Ukraine now. Children should not be killed or raped, and it is what Russian occupants do to Ukrainian children. And when the children grow up, they should not be killed in action. They should live in peace, and education for peace is a thing that can help and therefore really matters. However, odd it might seem, there is a lot that war has done for education. To be more exact, because of the war, people worldwide have learned a lot about Ukraine and its legacy and about Russia and its natural faith. Moreover, the war has helped Ukrainians understand who they really are and act accordingly. And finally, it has shown the world the priorities in the sustainable development goals and the need to rethink the ways of approaching them. Some months ago, most people in the world did not know what continent is Ukraine on. Moreover, they did not realize that there is such a country. Did you know a lot about Ukraine? Did you know the name of our president? Did you know a lot about Ukrainian education? If you didn't, that's okay, so never mind. But now the whole world knows that Ukraine is the country that ruined the myth about the second strongest army in the world. Even though Russia's population is 100 million people larger, to say nothing of its territory that is 28 times larger than Ukrainians. And now the whole world knows that Ukraine is a country of courageous and inventive people who value their independence and are ready to stand for it. Also, the world clearly sees, sees the Russian, uh, Russians' uh, true face, that of a terrorist country holding the whole world hostage and blackmailing it over energy and nuclear weapons. The country that for decades spent tremendous costs for weapons and propaganda instead of making citizens' lives civilized. Otherwise, they wouldn't have looted and stolen everything they could lay their hands on, from underwear to TV sets and washing machines. Russian soldiers from remote regions, and that is where they predominantly were from, had no idea of how to use modern conveniences. However, they knew how to torture, kill, rape, and loot. This is what they had learned from the lessons of Russia's history. What Ukrainians have learned from the history of Russian-Ukrainian relations is to be ready to defend themselves wherever they are in the army, or a school, university, shop, factory, everywhere. 
It is an incredible example of self-organizing, distributing functions and supporting each other. There is a very vivid association of Ukraine with a beehive. I heard it from Mikhailo Vinitsky and there are a lot of visuals demonstrating the idea. Every bee knows what to do and they make a perfect model of cohabitation. There is nothing imposed from the outside. Bees are peaceful and can even give people honey if they know the art of beekeeping. But beware of them if you are a stranger willing to ruin their perfect world. Far be it from me to say that our country is perfect. We do realize its weaknesses and see how tremendously much we will have to do after the war. We should use the momentum to get rich of the Soviet corrupt heritage. Throughout its history, Ukrainians have always been good at mobilizing in the fight against something or somebody. Unfortunately, they gradually lost their skill when the situation stabilized and returned to their usual practices. They were ready for a sprint, but not for a marathon. No way this cruel war will let us roll down. Too many victims, too many lessons. This time, we are learning to unite in the fight for something. To be more exact, for our existence, our freedom, our children, and our future. And with this at stake, we will learn to run the marathon of building a new country, which is impossible without high quality education. Actually, this war has shown that the whole world is on the verge of a tremendous change. And what is the role of universities in the age of disruption, crisis and change? Ideally, they are to perform the, their unique function as enablers of constructive change and peaceful life, ensuring that the world is moving towards sustainable go development goals. And what does the war have to do with the goals? Let us remember them. There are 17 of them. And number 16 is peace, justice, and strong institutions. Number 16 out of 17. Last but one. If goal 16, which is peace, justice, and strong institutions, does not become the number one, all other goals may become unattainable. As a result of this war, the global food supply has been severely disrupted as Ukraine is one of the world's key food suppliers. Russians bomb fields, burn and steal crops and block exports from Ukraine to the countries that need it desperately. There may be poverty and there may be starving people. New global waves of migration may slow economic growth and give rise to inequalities. With Russian, Russia's blackmail, energy may be unaffordable. Fires caused by missile strikes and atomic stations without safety control may lead to severe population and climate change. Our planet is so tiny. We all can suffer from mad ambitions to return the Soviet Union, the authoritarian country of terror. Ukrainians do not want back in the USSR. We want to live in peace. We want our planet to have the future. We hope that the voice of Ukraine matters. So you see, this talk is not about complex syntax. It is more about the complex situation in our complex world. And it is not about the prepositions against and for that matter, though they do. It is about our moral choices and actions and about education for peace that does matter. I'm ready for your questions uh, and uh, here are some signs, maybe these visuals will inspire you for asking questions and here you can see my contact uh, 
and uh, the contact of Ukrainian Educational Research Association and the website of our organization. Thank you very much, Oksana, for your thoughtful presentation. 